Hello, my name is Mary Rose, and welcome to The Billion Dollar Painting. Chances are, the first work of art that will sell for one billion dollars already exists. Today, we're going to talk about the Dutch artist Vincent van Gogh, and look into the eyes of a man who knew him sometimes better than he knew himself. We'll ask why some artists aren't appreciated during their lifetimes, and we'll ask if this particular painting could become the first billion dollar artwork. As always, you can find accompanying pictures and further reading for today's show on our website, BillionDollarPodcast.com. On July 22, 1890, Theo van Gogh wrote a letter to his brother Vincent. In it, he discusses some light business work, some stories about his family, but he also makes a request to his brother. Quote, I hope, my dear Vincent, that your health is good. And as you said, you're writing with difficulty and don't speak to me about your work. I'm a little afraid that there's something that's bothering you or that isn't going right. In that case, do go see Dr. Gachet. He'll perhaps give you something that will buck you up again. Give me news of you as soon as possible. Unquote. A week later, on July 29th, 1890, Vincent van Gogh shot himself in the chest with a revolver. He was 37 years old. We will rewind a bit to get started. Vincent van Gogh had been struggling as an artist almost, it seems, since he began. He was born in Zundert in the Netherlands on March 30th, 1853, and became interested in art from a very young age. He worked as an art dealer in London, then as a missionary in Belgium, and then he began to paint seriously back home with his parents in the Netherlands. When he moved to France, he continued to be supported by his brother Theo, he became friends with the artist Paul Gauguin, and together they were painting voraciously in the 1880s, supported by Theo's monetary uh, business mind. They were brothers, united against a world that didn't understand their vision, but they were both rather explosive characters. In 1888, one particularly vicious fight catapulted Vincent into such a state that he severed ties with Gauguin and cut part of his own ear off. At that time, he needed money. He needed support. Theo, who had trained down from Paris to Arla to comfort his brother, only stayed for a day. Still, he made arrangements for Vincent. In May of 1889, Vincent entered San Paula de Moselle Asylum. When we think of asylums today, we often think of horrifying 20th century institutions, think something out of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But this was really more of a rest home. He had a personal carer and his own room without padded walls. And in his free time, he continued to paint. It was during the stay at St. Paul that he painted what many consider to be his masterpiece, The Starry Night, which can now be seen at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Van Gogh stayed at the asylum for about a year before moving on. The painter Camille Pissarro had recommended a certain Dr. Gachet, who was an amateur painter himself and very well equipped to handle artists in his practice. A lot can be gleaned about these months because many of Van Gogh's letters survive and have been put online. I'll link them in the show notes and I'll tweet them as well. They are utterly fascinating and you can trace Vincent's relationship with his doctor throughout the letters. On October 4th, 1889, Theo wrote to Vincent about the doctor who does paintings in his free moments, who is in touch with all the Impressionists. Then, writing again in March of 1890, Theo again told Vincent that he had finally met Gachet himself and that, quote, He looks like a man who understands things well. He resembles you a little. When you come here, we'll go and see him. He comes to give consultations in Paris several times a week. He said to me when I told him how your crises occurred that he didn't believe this had anything to do with madness, and that if it was what he thought, he replied that he would cure you, but he needed to see you and talk to you to be able to give his opinion with greater certainty. He's a man who can be very useful for us if you come here. By May, we know that Vincent had indeed met the man. Quote, I've seen Dr. Gachet, who gave me the impression of being rather eccentric, but his doctor's experience must keep him balanced himself while combating the nervous ailment from which it seems to me he's certainly suffering at least as seriously as I am. Unquote. Going on, he told Theo he'd like to paint the man, 
And this sense that Vincent gets that Geshe was his companion in madness really does continue throughout his letters both to Theo and to their sister, Willemine. In a second letter to Theo in May of 1890, Vincent asks, Now when one blind man leads another blind man, do they both not fall into the ditch? Then to Wilhelmine in June, he wrote that Dr. Gachet was a, quote, ready-made friend, and that he had finally completed a portrait of him. In fact, he had painted two versions of the same portrait. He even used Dr. Gachet's own printing press to create an engraving of that same composition, which he gave to Gachet as a gift. There are approximately 114 known impressions from that plate, one of which survives in the Louvre today, and others that are scattered throughout the world, in Europe, the Americas, Asia, and Africa. One of the paintings, the second version, ended up in the hands of Dr. Gachet's children and hangs the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, but it's the first version that we're going to discuss today. In this portrait, Dr. Gachet leans on his right hand and stares past the viewer. He wears a pale, cream-colored hat and a dark blue suit. The elbow of his right hand and the fingers of his left are raising on a table, and then there are also flowers that are foxgloves and a stack of books as well. There's this very pleasing color balance in the painting. The doctor's red hair and warm-colored face match pleasantly with the table, while his blue coat complements the undulating blue hills in the background. Van Gogh, whose likeness has been preserved in many of his self-portraits rather than in photographs, was right in saying that in appearance, at least, Dr. Gachet was very much his twin. There's the red hair, the long and thin nose, the hollow cheeks, and then there's also something of the melancholia in him that characterizes many of Van Gogh's moody kind of portraits and faces in his work. This is part of the appeal of the portrait. In the man who was his closest companion in the last few months of his life, we see a little bit of Vincent van Gogh as well. Part of what makes Gachet so fascinating is that he seems to sense the genius of the Impressionists well before a great majority of the Parisian art world. The Impressionists were roundly mocked for their paintings, which went against the neoclassical style preferred by many in the Parisian art scene and in the salons. The name Impressionist is itself an insult, it was derived from a painting by Claude Monet called Impression Sunrise, which the art critic Louis Leroy roundly mocked, which isn't so much of a surprise. He said that it was a joke, that it was an impression rather than a painting. And yet, despite all of this, Paul Ferdinand Gachet was in correspondence with several of the most famous Impressionists we recognize today, including Monet, Renoir, and Cezanne. Van Gogh constantly struggled for money and recognition during his lifetime, and many of his paintings are of the various landlords for whom he was a tenant. He was friendly with other artists of his generation, most notably Paul Gauguin, but his uneven temperament and addiction to absinthe led to outbursts that often left him alone. Theo was Vincent's most ardent champion, pushing his works in his own circles. While Vincent was certainly not absolutely unknown, he didn't achieve the level of acclaim we associate with him today until after his death in the early 1900s. It was then that the art world looked back and mourned the creativity of a man who had been lost. Now, Van Gogh and the rest of the Impressionists are some of the most beloved artists of all time. Henri Matisse was inspired by Van Gogh's artworks that he saw in the early retrospectives and went on to embrace Van Gogh's love of colors in his own Fauvist works. Van Gogh's contemporaries Paul Cezanne and Paul Gauguin created works that are at one point the most expensive paintings ever sold. You'll be hearing more about them in upcoming episodes. Van Gogh has his own museum in Amsterdam, which I can highly recommend if you can pry yourself away from the Rijksmuseum in the Red Light District. His works are in museums around the world. Only a few dozen of his enormous body of work are still in private hands. While Van Gogh was being celebrated by the art world after his death, there also came to be this kind of suspicion about what had happened about his death. Some thought that it was too odd that Vincent would have committed suicide by shooting himself in the chest. Of course, most suicide victims shoot themselves in the head. And so it's thought that it must have been, instead, a murder. 
others turned their suspicions on Dr. Gachet himself. Gachet, who was born in 1828, was educated at the University of Paris, graduating in 1858. He showed an early interest in psychology, and in particular melancholia, which is an out-of-use term for a cluster of medical conditions that today are usually ascribed to depression. Gachet was born in a generation that would abandon the age-old practice of just locking psychiatric patients up and abusing them. Instead, it was part of a generation that actually tried to find solutions. He studied at two hospitals that had been under the influence of French physician Philippe Pinel, who encouraged what he called the quote-unquote moral treatment of psychiatric disorders. Basically, this was an attempt to analyze the patient, ask them, interview them, and kind of get them to talk about what was happening in hopes of finding a treatment that would actually work. This is also part of the generation that would inspire Sigmund Freud's psychiatric work. Gachet went on to serve in the front lines of the wars with Prussia in 1870, more as a surgeon than a psychiatric doctor, before retiring from military service in 1872. In that year, his wife was sick with tuberculosis, and so Gachet moved with her out to the countryside for fresh air. His wife died in 1885, and he met Vincent in 1890. In the intervening years, Gachet had become a student of homeopathic medicine, and he tried both this and the moral treatment on Vincent. Of course, today, with the benefit of hindsight, we know there was little that a 19th century physician could have done for Vincent. Psychiatric care and medications were a long way off from being of real help. That did not stop the French writer and actor Antonin Artois from blaming Gachet and society for Van Gogh's untimely death, nor others after him. And yet, for the time that they knew each other, Vincent was experiencing one of the most prolific periods of his life. In the last two months, while he was under Dr. Gachet's care, he completed 70 paintings. His letters to Theo are more full of joy than they were of sorrow, and he even reached out to Gauguin again, trying to repair that relationship through letters, although they never did see each other again. The portrait of Dr. Gachet has an unusually precise provenance for works we've been discussing lately. From its inception in 1890, we can trace it through the hands of Vincent's brother Theo, through Theo's life, and then into the illustrious hands of Ambrose Villard. Villard, who we mentioned briefly in the episode about Picasso's La Reve, was one of the great art personalities of the period. Villard had almost a Midas touch with artworks. He turned artists into superstars, and it was he who mounted several retrospectives of Vincent van Gogh's artworks throughout the 1900s in his various galleries in France and throughout the rest of Europe. So the portrait of Dr. Gachet passed through Villard's hands in 1897, going through about five different hands until ending up in the Stadisch Gallery, which was an art museum in Frankfurt, Germany. This was in the 19-teens, and you might be able to guess what happens next. In 1933, the Nazi regime in Germany formed the Reich Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. It was headed by Joseph Goebbels, a senior Nazi minister, and its goal was to create a consensus of German culture and ideology that could be broadcasted through the Nazi propaganda machine and to the German people. The ministry received the portrait from the Stadisch Gallery, and so it joined this kind of funnel of artworks that were making their way into the estate of one of the heads of the Nazi party, Hermann Göring. The Nazi officials, especially the leading SS officers, were massive collectors of artwork, and so they would get the artwork into these institutions where they could pick and choose their favorites. Some of them were then liquidated. That is to say, they were sold through, quote-unquote, I guess you could call them legitimate art dealers, although, of course, they were dealing with the Nazis. And so they would move their way outside of Europe. And this was what happened to Vincent van Gogh's portrait. The portrait was mercifully not included in the doomed degenerate art exhibition, which was an exhibition that focused on artworks that were seen as being morally repugnant. And so the it was very lucky because the portrait was saved. So at this point, Goring sold it into the German banker and renowned modernist collector Franz Konings, who later passed it on to Siegfried Kramarski, who was a German-Jewish banker based in Amsterdam. When Kramarski fled Amsterdam in 1938, he took the portrait of Dr. Gachet with him to the United States. This was the end of the story for the portrait for over half a century, 
And so amid all of this, no one heard about the portrait of Dr. Gachet until 1990. It was in a Christie's New York auction on May 15, 1990, that Komarski's descendants put up the portrait for sale. The winner of the auction was Japanese businessman and honorary chairman of Daishawa Paper Manufacturing Co., Royoi Saito. And it was part of this big wave of Japanese collecting. The Japanese economy had been going strong in the 1880s and 1890s with the computer and personal electronics boom. The final price was $82.5 million. Of his acquisition, Royoi Saito said, quote, It is my principle to get what I want, no matter how much money it costs. Unquote. Following that sale, he created quite a stir by saying that he wanted the painting to be cremated with him, which caused many people to cry foul. While a painting is a personal object and a private object, and you're as inclined as able, really, to do whatever you want to it, they also take on these public identities. While working in an auction house, I remember saying to a client that you never really own a master artwork. You merely hold on to it for the next generation. And I think many people would agree, which is why we love public museums. We know that a Van Gogh painting takes on this historical importance and a public importance, despite the fact that it's also a private object. For the record, Saito later rescinded this, calling it both a joke and an exaggeration for his love of the painting, and the art world breathed a collective sigh of relief. Vincent van Gogh is as popular as he has ever been, especially with the release of Loving Vincent, the 2017 film animated entirely with oil paintings in the style of many of the great artists, and starring many of the people who sat for his most famous portraits. It's part of this love of Vincent van Gogh that makes me think that perhaps the portrait of Dr. Gachet or another Vincent van Gogh artwork would be one of my top contenders for a billion dollar painting. There's just very few artists who have the kind of broadspread cultural appeal that Van Gogh has. In the letter to his sister, one of the last that he wrote to her, Vincent wrote that, quote, There are modern heads that may be looked at for a long time, and that may perhaps be looked back on with longing a hundred years later, unquote. For the portrait of Dr. Gachet, we certainly have, and if Royo e. Saito elects to sell the painting, we might see the first billion dollar painting. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe and leave a five-star review. It helps more people find their way to the show. You can also find more information about the portrait of Dr. Gachet and other works of art by visiting the website billiondollarpodcast.com. You can tweet at us at Billion Painting, follow our Instagram at the Billion Dollar Painting, or you can email us at thebilliondollarpainting at gmail.com. See you next week.